for coming out again on a, a lovely Wednesday evening with the, braving the weather to come out this evening, so that's great. Um, tonight's lecture is going to be about raising capital. I'm going to spend the first probably just 10 minutes talking about government programs at a cursory level, kind of just discussing um, kind of the experience of the startups that we've worked with, have had with government programs. And then I'm going to turn it over to our speaker this evening, Bernie Aho, uh, to speak about uh, angel investing and kind of his experience with angel investors and raising capital uh, for his startups. So I've only got four slides, so just bear with me here. Um, there are a lot of government funding programs available. Um, all you have to do is put in Google government funding programs, Ontario government funding programs, Canada, and you will be inundated with all sorts of options, all sorts of links, all sorts of uh, 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 different programs that are available to startups, to small and medium enterprises, to people who are just getting their business going. Knowing which ones are most applicable to the business that you're looking to start really ends up being, becoming the challenge because there are so many out there. And a lot of them have varying uh, eligibility requirements depending on what sector you're in, depending on the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, uh, business that you're starting, depending on the technology that you're using. It can be very great because a lot of them can be, are specific to supporting certain technologies and others you know, that might be a great program, it sounds great, but you're not eligible because I don't have two years of financials. I'm just getting started, or uh, in some cases, I may have been in business too long. So there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot there. So really, if I can encourage you to do anything, get into the eligibility requirements and truly understand that program that you're looking to apply to. The Regional Business Center has a fantastic funding handbook. If you haven't gone and knocked on their door to find out about their uh, programs and services, um, I would highly recommend you do that. And on your way in or out, ask for that funding handbook because it really is, uh, it's really handy to have on your, on your desk or just to be able to leaf through. They literally go ministry by ministry, program by program, and they keep it fairly up to date. There is also a concierge uh, uh, service available online uh, through the federal government. And it does go into, uh, it, it does get into pr provincial programs as well. Um, NORCAT actually appears on there, so that's good. Um, but definitely check it out too if you're looking at that. All right. Funding organizations that you should be aware of and that you could probably just hop to right away. We have the Ontario Centers of Excellence. Again, these are one of those funding, pr uh, funding organizations that have very specific programs. So it really is more specific to if you're a student in an academic institution or you just recently graduated, you're commercializing uh, intellectual property coming out of academia of some kind. Um, you're just getting started, so they do have some startup programming available. And then they've got some really specific targeted programs for cutting down on greenhouse gases uh, and clean technologies, autonomous vehicles, and I think uh, 5G networks is one of the ones that is going to be coming out. So, I mean, you can take a look, but in a lot of cases, unless you're working out of an academic institution, you're a recent graduate, or you're developing a technology that is specific to those focus areas, a lot of the funding programs actually won't apply. Uh, for FedNOR, or sorry, let's uh, Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation and FedNOR, being Northerners living here in Northern Ontario, we actually have an advantage in that we have two specific um, uh, funding organizations that are uh, committed to developing business here in Northern Ontario. So Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation is managed through the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines, and it's specific to uh, uh, Northern Ontario companies. And FedNOR looks after the same thing only at the federal level. The Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation actually does a really fantastic job of outlining their programs specifically. You know, this is what the eligibility requirements are. This is what we'll fund. This isn't what we'll fund. There's a brochure, uh, a brochure you can download. So definitely check it out. And it is really programmatic. So they've got internships. They've got infrastructure. They've got uh, innovation. They've got um, uh, a couple other things. But they are really specific in, in depending on what you're looking to do. They are one of those organizations, though, that unless you've got two or three years of, of finances or you're looking to, you're looking to uh, uh, get $100,000 or $200,000 or even kind of some of the smaller chunks, it might not be the most applicable to a startup or, or even one of those Main Street businesses. Okay, so just be aware of that when you go in to, uh, and you knock on that door. Same with FedNOR. Uh, so I should mention with the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, each program has a specific funding application associated with it. With FedNOR, it's kind of one application fits all. 
you apply, you say what, what you're interested in, and then there's a, a phase two should you make it on to the next level. Uh, the Industrial Research Acceleration Program, and I gotta be careful what I say here because Linda's actually in the audience, and she's our IRAP rep. Um, but they fund exactly what it says they fund, industrial research. Um, so you have to be innovative, you have to be developing a product or some kind of solution to a problem in industry of some kind. It can be broad, they've got some very, uh, some really great expertise through them. Um, they've got, well, people like Linda who have very niche expertise and a range of sectors across Canada. So they're a great resource uh, if you're kind of, if you're in the, those areas or um, you're looking to get, I think, some market research or just some background on, on the industry that you're looking to get into as well. National, uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, again, more specific to uh, academia, colleges, and, and, and universities. They do have some funding programs. If you're, if you're looking to use an applied research department through a college or university, a lot of times they will, they will be applying to uh, NSERC to, to make that, that research project happen. I know there are a couple of people here looking to do kind of digital media things, so I put these in there for you. The Ontario Media Development Corporation, it's not grant funding, it's a repayable loan. All right, same with the Canadian uh, Media Fund. So these are for, if you're looking to get into, uh, you're developing applications like so, social media applications, you're developing games, you're doing uh, uh, videography, or you're developing uh, film and television, those are programs that you can look into, but again, be, be, just be aware that they're repayable loans, they're not straight up granting programs, okay? NORCAT and the Regional Business Center were also funding organizations. The only caveat there is that you have to be, uh, you have to be a NORCAT client uh, for the Innovation Mills purposes, or with the Regional Business Center, you have to be participating in one of their programs. So their starter company, their starter company plus, their summer company, for us it's, um, uh, we have the Small Farm Assistance Program, which is actually funded through IRAP, but it's specific to doing work out at our mine site. So you kind of, it's kind of niche in that it's, it's focused on mining. And for the last two years, we offered an innovation acceleration program, uh, and that was funded through FedNOR. And companies are, are, are uh, the companies that we we're working with were able to access up to $10,000 in grant funding uh, through that program. So. A lot of these smaller organizations, these not-for-profits that are funded by some of these bigger organizations, often have these smaller pools of, uh, of capital that they're able to deploy to startups. And that's kind of how the government does that support because it's attached to some programmatic kind of intervention or making sure that you're getting the business advice that you need along with the grant funding. Uh, funding tips. I highly recommend if you're going to go after any kind of funding program, you meet with one of the representatives uh, and speak to them about the project that you're looking to do and the program that you're looking to apply for, okay? They wanna know who you are, what you're doing, be able to have that conversation with you so when that, your name shows up on that application in their inbox, they know who you are, they know what's going on, all right? It's always great to build those relationships too uh, ahead of time so that they can tell you, this is how you should craft that, 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 uh, that funding application, or these are the things that we're looking for so that you can align your application uh, to those goals. They fund projects. So unlike angel investment, like we'll get into, that funds the company to do whatever the company wants. A lot of these funders fund specific projects that the company is looking to do, all right? So a lot of these, these, these funding programs are looking for you to do a specific project with that money. So I am going to increase my productivity by installing this piece of machinery, therefore I'm applying to buy that piece of machinery to increase my productivity. That's a specific project wrapped up into that. It's not, I'm going to fund my, you're, you're going to fund my operations so I can expand. It's gotta be very specific so they can track where the money goes, they have that, 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 that paper trail, and that they can follow up and understand what, and you, uh, with, with reporting requirements. So that's kind of the last bit here. All these funding programs come with reporting requirements. So understand what you're obligated to report on and what they're gonna be asking of you as a startup or as a small business when you apply to these programs and if you're successful in getting them. All right. Um, a lot of the times they're looking for how many jobs did you create, uh, how much revenue did you generate uh, as a result of installing or going through with that project, what kind of, if you said that you were gonna be more productive, what can you show me to, to say that you were more productive? And a lot of times there's also a, you know, there's a press release and there's a photo op associated with it. Um, 
you're going to need to put skin in the game. So a lot of these funding programs will require that you have matching dollars. Uh, for NOHFC, FedNOR, some of those other programs, it's 50-50 matching. You're asking for $50,000, you have to have $50,000 to match that 50,000. Okay, so the total project cost is 100. Um, a lot of the times though, they, you can stack them. So if you ask for 50 from NOHFC uh, and you're successful in that, you might be able to stack it against FedNOR and get 50 from FedNOR as well. So you've, you've kind of doubled that money. But again, that's where having that conversation with the representative really comes in handy because they'll be able to talk you through the specifics of what that process looks like. Uh, and be prepared to wait. Government works on government time. Okay, they're not on necessarily on your startup time. Okay, so you know it could be four months, it could be six months, it could be a year, it could be 18 months before you see those dollars. All right, so if you're going to apply, make sure that that project is not really integral to you getting off the, off the ground right away, which is also why a lot of those programs really don't skew towards startup, they skew towards the small uh, or medium enterprise because they're able to wait on those dollars or they're able to finance the project and then get reimbursed as they go along. All right, so with FedNOR and NOHFC specifically, when you apply, your application is date stamped. So should you be successful in getting that funding and you move forward with that project, you can actually claim expenses back to when that, that application was date stamped. All right, but should you not be successful and you still incur those costs, you're still, you're, you're stuck paying for them. All right. For the NOHFC and FedNOR, that's, that's kind of how they work. So. Definitely, if, if, there's, if there's two things I, can, I, I would really highly recommend is, and emphasize, meet with the funder, meet with that representative, have that conversation with them so they know who you are and, what's going, and what you're trying to do. And then also, align your project with the funder's stated goals, plans, or, or reason for being. FedNOR, NO, uh, sorry, NOHFC, they have a Northern Growth Program all right, it's very, or a Northern Growth Plan. It's very specific, you can download the PDF. These are their goals for, literally for the next five years and these are the sectors that they're looking to fund. If you can somehow align your project or your business uh, with those, you're gonna be uh, uh, more successful or have a better chance of being successful in getting that funding. All right, so make sure you understand why these funders exist in the first place and how you can align yourself uh, with them, all right? Funding themes, you'll see this a lot right now. Uh, what you'll see is it's gotta be innovation, it's gotta be productivity related. They're looking to scale up uh, uh, interesting startups that have already received some of that, that money. Uh, they have an interesting technology. They've managed to get some, uh, some angel investment or their first seed round. And now the government is looking to leverage that and put some more money in them so they can scale up faster. We're all familiar with Shopify. All right, that's one of probably the best examples of a Canadian company that's been able to scale right now. They started off really small. They're up to about 3,000 employees now. Okay, so the government is interested in supporting companies that are going to have that ability to scale and grow that much. All right, and then you'll also see it's a lot about research and development, a lot about commercialization. Put this little caveat in here because if you're a Main Street business, if you're looking to start a restaurant, if you're looking to open a hair salon, if you're looking to do a consulting business, you're looking to do like even open a, a dentist office, a lot of these programs will not apply to you. All right, because again, these are the areas that they're looking for. If you're a dentist and you've got an, an interesting and innovative product, that's what they're looking to, to, to invest in. They're not looking to invest in your, your practice per se. All right, unless you're expanding and you're creating jobs and now you're applying for an infrastructure grant, but that falls a little outside of uh, what, what, they're, what they really are looking to fund, okay? So again, just be aware, have that conversation with the funder and all of their information because they're government programs, all the information about eligibility, what they'll fund, what they won't fund is online, so Google really is your friend in this regard. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, some of my journey in, in raising capital over a couple of companies and also a lot of lessons learned that I've, uh, that I've experienced just going through the process. Um, and to touch based on what Kyle was saying, every company that I'll tell you a little bit about today, we've taken advantage of the government funding and the government programs uh, as, as many as we could. We've I've done NHFC, we've done IRAP, we've done SRD tax credit. Um, a lot of what we've done, what my experience from is on the innovation side, so mostly in tech, uh, mostly doing innovative things and um, building teams and that sort of thing. So 
there's a lot of different ways that you can actually fund your company, and I think this kind of this this chart sort of shows a little bit of that of depending on how much you need, um, and I think that's a very realistic thing when you think about what type of business, what is your capital um, requirements, and what stage that you're at. So. A lot of this has to do with sort of like, where do you want to take the business? Is this a lifestyle business? Is this sort of a, a we call it venture business or something that's scalable that you want to take global? Or is this something that is, you just want to do the equivalent of having a, a jobs income? So there's a lot of different sort of um, ways when you're getting started, but I, I have the most experience thinking about something that was a big idea that I want to take global. So that's where I'm going to speak the most of. Something, something like that, which usually starts very root, sort of cocktail napkin level. Um, but I still have the same advice for people as trying to prolong the, the need for taking outside sort of equity until you've really proven something. I think there's a, there's a huge advantage to that, only because you get to move a lot quicker than would you would as soon as you have somebody who um, wants their money back and is going to be talking to you on a regular basis saying where you're at now, where you're at now. It gives you the freedom to sort of explore and learn and run some experiments before sort of having to really sort of be really accountable in a very big way. And I think if you want to do anything else then you have to be sort of ready for those, um, you know, ready for that to happen that you're literally accountable for all of everything that you do. So going from the, the beginning here, so under 50k, like do as much as you can, get from friends, um, and, and uh, Kickstarter is one for somebody to have product-based ideas. Um, once you get past that, then th there's other ways too, like, and, and sort of usually where we start in, in the tech world is you have an idea, like I have this idea for this app, or I have this idea for this, um, you know, the software, I have an idea, I have this product that I think everyone in the world could use. You still sometimes still start in this 50 to 500K area, um, and usually with that, comes down to is you start thinking about, okay, well, what do I need to kind of get to the next level, or at least build a prototype if I haven't built one already, and kind of what's that going to cost, and how many people need to be involved in that. And, and this is where you start to think about conversations of like, do I need co-founders? Do I need um, other people around? And, and we'll get touched a little bit about that um, a little bit later on in terms of like filling in the different gaps of your business. But um, for us, it's always been, okay, let's get to a prototype. Let's be able to either leave our jobs or supplement our jobs or build a prototype, get some development done, whatever it is. Um, and so we tried to do as much as we can on our free time, meeting um, you know, on weekends and nights. And, and we don't want to spend anything until we're really, really sure. And then we can have something to give. And then there's a whole different set of um, pl people who will give you money. Because if, if you haven't done anything, you don't have any revenue, you don't have anything like that, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be difficult to get any sort of like bank loans unless like somebody's building a co-sign for you or anything like that. It's going to be difficult to get a lot of different funding. And that's the sort of why we started to get into angel investors. And where angel investors fit into the community is, is sort of um, giving you access. People who just have a lot of excess capital or just ha really like that part and they want to give back and they want to feel like they're helping you out. So they, they feel like they want to be an advisor to you. They want to, uh, you know, and they expect good returns as well. So that's a big part of it too. Like, um, and, and from the tech side, it's probably true of most businesses. Most angel investors, when they come in early at a, in a stage in a company, they're expecting to be eight to 10 times um, the return. So it's something you have to think about too, is whenever you take in money, if you take in like, like $100,000 that, you know, they're gonna wanna see an eight time return on that. Like th that's a reality. So that means you have to make at least like the revenue that you think beyond that so that their cut of it is that. So that's when you start to get into sort of like, well, how much do they get for that? And, and that's sort of, we can touch a little bit about that in the future, but um, once you get past sort of like into the million dollars mark, that like gets a different sort of set. Like um, usually right around sort of the super angel seed growth stage VC, this is sort of where most people play. Once you get past that, that's a different stage of business. And that's usually people who probably wouldn't, um, you know, um, need any of this other sort of capital. That's already, they've already done all this part, but you can get to some of these ex other stages. Um, at, depending on your idea, how quickly d is, uh, how fast you go and how interesting your idea is. So if you have something that's, you know, it's just, you've proven all, it checks all the boxes across all the different um, areas that investors find um, to be, to make you a, a, like a very low risk um, uh, venture, then you can sometimes jump up there pretty quickly. Um, like I said, angel investors usually help you lead. That, that's the, easy, the easiest money you can get because um, you just have to convince those people. They give you some money. You can do a bunch of them, and then they could, you're giving away parts of your company for it. 
Um, and then that's kind of the best part to get started and then sort of leverage that against the government, sort of what Kyle was saying for the projects. Um, and then after that stage, um, you, then you get into the seed stage venture capital or something like that, which is still same, similar to angels. They usually come in on the same sort of uh, terms or whatnot. Um, they're still after part of your company. Um, depending on their sector, it, it, they're gonna go through the same sort of due diligence that an angel would. It's just in a bigger way. They're actually looking for a big scale. And depending on where they come in your company, they're looking for a return as well. And depending on how early they are, and they're also looking to go on your next stage. But from, from an entrepreneur's standpoint, is you wanna take just enough money at each stage to get you to the next milestone. You don't wanna take more than that. Even if you think that you have the next five years already planned out in your head, you, you are doing your, yourself a disvalue if you um, raise too much too quickly because you want to have just enough that you prove the milestone because then you're more valuable. And the more that you sort of achieve milestones, the more and more valuable you become. And it's really important to, as you start to plan your businesses, is to set those milestones really early. Set what success actually means to you because then it's, once you achieve it, you'll know and you'll be able to ratchet your efforts to it. So you're like, I know, I thought I would achieve this by December, um, and then you could know if you're getting there, because you know December's coming up closely, and either you hit it or you didn't. But if you have this history of hitting your milestones again and again, um, people are gonna be sort of attracted to that. Investors are gonna be attracted to that, especially if you have a proven history of that. And it's actually gonna be really easy to, to hire people, because you, you just have this culture of sort of hitting your milestones, hitting your milestones, hitting your milestones. Um, so that's like my first experience, and this is sort of me right out of school, so quite a while ago, but I, I sort of like, my first job at college, it wasn't my company, but I came into a place where the CEO was just sort of, just left the company and the whole company, it was a tech company, but it all fell on the CFO's hands. And so this is a finance guy who's now having to run the company. And so I'm coming in and, and the biggest skills I think coming out of school is just being really resourceful and really being able to like good research and be able to sort of learn things really quickly and kept get up to speed with it. So this was a tech, uh, I was never, a, a, I'm not a computer programmer, I'm nothing like that. I, um, I, I was, you know, I flew around with tech a little bit, but back then I knew almost nothing. Um, but I had to learn really quickly. And what I discovered is that what they were doing wasn't the right sort of like, they were in the right space and, and all these different things that we started to, we had to like take a, a company of 35 and bring it down to 12 and then really build it back up. So I'm at a very young age, they were really impressed with what I did, but we had to, uh, I had to learn a tremendous amount. And then I was almost like number two in the company just because of like how hungry and aggressive I was. Um, so I, I felt like, I say that only because this feels like it was one of my startups, even though I had almost no equity at all, like I had zero, this wasn't my company, but I treated it, it was like my company because I didn't know any better. I want, this also taught me to think very global right at the beginning, just because of the stage that they were at. Um, I did almost, we knew we had to raise some capital in order to go, because we just hired, we just had to build back to 26 employees. Um, so we started hitting um, the road, and again, it was just me and the finance guy. So I was basically communicating like the founder, even though I was really young. So I, but I didn't know anything a lot about, like I didn't know a lot about business. I didn't know a lot about what these investors want, what made a good business. I didn't know anything. I wasn't a domain expert, um, which I'll touch in a, in a bit. I didn't really have like the experience. I didn't have any of those things going for me. And so it really just came down to business model. So I say 40 plus meetings, and it, it, it honestly could have been like something closer to 70, but those are meetings with investors. So local angel investors, a lot of them like right at the beginning, they, they wouldn't bite, but they would ask you a bunch of questions and they would just sort of hammer me and say like, you know, all these different things, like what is your business? What is your market? What is your competition? All those types of things that you do all the time. And you had the kind of like normal answers, but just sometimes they'd catch you and I'd have to write it down. And I kind of knew that that meeting wasn't gonna go well and then do another one and then another one. And then we started getting, like the meeting started getting bigger and bigger as we got more interest because we got a little bit of angel. Um, but then we started going to like road trips to Toronto, to New York, to Boston, to big like these funds that have billions and billions of dollars. and. That was, that was like the biggest lesson, the biggest sort of like hard knocks MBA I ever had. Um, and and I'll, uh, later in the, in, the, in the presentation, I'll show you some of the lessons I learned that they sort of like hammered me in that I sort of want to sort of tell everyone else. Um, but we were able to raise at the end of 40 meetings. We got really, really good at sort of how to structure a business and how to connect all the dots together, of course, of like what, what people, are, what the, the investors are looking for. Um, in terms of your product, your company, your team, and what all those parts are and how to build those up. And sometimes we have to do that with hires and milestones, but we kind of, uh, eventually we got a super angel, which we call, which was, those, those are the three individuals that put in a million dollars each. 
but it was strategic. So this was something that was strategic to our business. They had, uh, they had domain expertise in what they were doing and they, they felt that they would have a reasonable um, return because they, of what they can contribute to the company. So that was, that's some of the best capital you can get because those are the people that go on your boards and those people that go along the way and you want to sort of make them happy, so they want to see you do really well, just like any other investor, but when it's strategic, you feel like they work for you now, but you didn't have to buy them. They're, just, they're actually giving you money to, for them to help you out. Um, these are out of order, but uh, Concept Show is the next company. There's uh, it's kind of one between, but that was more healthcare. Um, well, I'll touch on that a bit. So the, the healthcare one's interesting only because the lessons learned I have sort of like when I want to kind of go into a company with somebody else, I was already starting to understand the getting the entrepreneurial bug. It's like, okay, I, I, I've learned a lot about the other elements of the business, not just my job. And again, I was just forced into that role, but I kind of, I kind of liked that part of it. I liked the idea that I wasn't just a product person. I was understanding finance. I was understanding pricing. I was understanding that other stuff. So what I um, eventually did is I teamed up after uh, that company sold was with uh, a physician, and, and we were working on a technology together. Um, and for me, it's like, I was trying to, it was like sort of when you break up with somebody and you want to find somebody that has all of the traits that that person didn't have, you know, if, like if they were like really messy, you wanted somebody that was clean, that kind of thing. So I was like trying to find somebody that had domain expertise. Because that guy, the, the CFO had no domain expertise at all. He, we were in a tech company doing 3D software. He had no idea. So I wanted to be, work with somebody that had absolute domain expertise and that was smart and do all the stuff. So, so we had a company that worked together um, and it, it, it did fairly well and we, and we sold that company relatively quickly and it was sort of like a stepping stone that led me to that because I was, again, I was new, I had a low percentage in the company and then I sort of wanted to do it on my own. So that's when we founded Concept Share um, and this is sort of like while we're at actually at the, uh, in between places. So I teamed up with my founders, um, the, sort of my, my main co-founder and we sort of developed this idea and it wasn't the original idea we had, we did a bunch of ideas and then making the ideas is, Going through the ideas, we found a problem, a market problem, because we couldn't find tools to, um, to do what we wanted to do. So we developed Concept Share, which is like this online annotation collaboration suite. Um, so we started that from, literally, we literally just had scratches, like just, just concepts, nothing there. A lot of us get another co-founder, so that's part of the thing too, is like, we knew that he was the, uh, uh, my co-founder was like the hustler, we call him. He's like the sort of the business guy, the sales guy, that kind of thing. And I'm sort of the, it was the designer. So I sit on the design side, coming up with ideas, concepts, visualizing. And we know we needed a programmer. So we, could, we didn't have any money to hire a programmer. So we wanted to find one, attract one, and then bring them into the company. And so at this point, again, it's like my first venture that can have a little bit more say in it. Um, so we went three-way split. So that was just, that made sense for us because we covered all of the bases. We had, we had design, we had the hustling, and we had um, uh, the, the, the programming, so the hacking. That, that, that's, that model actually goes really well for anything involved in tech. Is you want to bring these people into your company because those are the people that are you going to have to get really good people and give them company, like um, shares because you won't be able to afford them. It's just the people that you need you usually can't afford. Um, but basically, we built a, um, once we hired that co-founder, we went from napkin to concept in about six months. Um, which is relatively quick. Um, and the concept was something, it was, it was a, a software that worked, but it wasn't talking about real data. Um, it didn't have anything, but it was enough and we, to, uh, that we could actually start showing somebody and trying to get some, our first sort of angel investment. So we had a list of, of 10 people that we thought we could approach and they were Canada wide. We had just come people locally. Um, so we, we actually pitched um, um, Michael Atkins, who runs Northern Ontario Business, Northern Life and whatnot. He was our first guy because we could get to him. We, we knew that we can get a meeting with him. He took a meeting with them, saw our, our prototype, and he uh, agreed to give us almost a half a million dollars right there on the spot. Um, so we didn't have any actually chance to get to number two, three, four, five, which we don't know, really know what would have happened or how that would have went. But, um, but that, and some of that is because I just went through all of this pitching and learning from companies past. So I kind of knew what they wanted. And some of that is sort of like, I'll, I'll touch a little bit about that. About that. Um, and our first customer was three months later, and we had a first acquisition offer a year, like a year from the beginning of it. So that was really accelerated, and that was just sort of putting a lot of what I learned into practice. And this company, we, did, we didn't take that acquisition offer because it was super early for us. And taking, and that, some of that was determined by, hey, if we probably didn't take that money, we wouldn't be able to get to um, scale that quickly. But we also, um, 
it kind of put in that line in the sand of like, okay, now that we took this half a million at the certain uh, valuation that, that he came in on, we knew we had to do, like I said, we had to do eight to 10 times better than that on any sort of acquisition. And the, the, the first offer, but it was a huge, huge company, um, wasn't sort of enough to meet sort of those requirements where the investors would have been happy. Um, and then several more came in on the year. And this company is still in existence and making millions and millions of dollars. I still own a, a really big share of the company. It's in Ottawa. Um, it's sort of gone, uh, it, it's, it's, a, and it's into enterprise operations management. Some of the logos you see down below, these are like legitimate companies that, um, you know, like Game of Thrones can't come out without going through this product. Like this, this was uh, an overwhelming success. But once it kind of gets into where it's like, uh, your, your function in the company is like a job, then that's usually my jumping off point to go do something else. That's what we sort of did time here, and this is sort of our most recent one in the current company I'm at right now. Um, so we've done three million investors a day, and that's actually made up of angel investment, government, which is a big portion of that as well, probably even a third, and venture capital. And, and we're one of the very lucky to, have, to be Silicon Valley backed. And so uh, Kyle mentioned Shopify. The, the people that funded Shopify, Fitbit, Angry Birds, all of those companies is the same funder that we actually have. So we were really lucky to have him. And that was a, a, a similar story to get that funding was we went to a trade show really early on, prototype level. We've already raised a little bit of an angel investment. We actually weren't looking to do any institution on this first round. Um, and the reason why is because A, we wanted to um, preserve. You can do a lot more with angel. You can have a lot more forgiveness and a lot sort of um, than you have once you start to get into institutional investors. So you have to be really, really ready for that. But we, you know, when, we, when they came to our booth, this one guy heard about us because everyone else was talking about the show. Quick demo, no deck, no business plan, no nothing. Just an initial pitch. Um, he was funding us by the next week. So he's, he was actually flying back to Palo Alto. We had, um, we had an offer uh, basically the, the, in the, the next day, like uh, by the next business day, by the time we got back. And that sort of blew our minds because that's just sort of like, hey, we did everything right. And, and it's because of uh, how we pitched it and how we sort of thought about our business and what also is important is what he's looking for in a company and what, how they evaluate companies and how they take chances on companies. And it has a lot to do with like, what do they think of the team? What do they think of the space? And how they can make all those conclusions really quickly. And I think that's true of like, anybody who's sort of pitching or writing a business plan or anything like that is like, if you get all those pieces right and have all those, like connect all those dots, it's actually really simple. And people don't, as long as your idea is pretty good, that's, that's a big part of it. But once you fill out all those pieces, um, you, and if you don't have those pieces, then you fill those pieces or you have a timeline to get there. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec, but, um, but yeah, government's been a big part, angel investment's a bigger part, and that's usually sort of we start. Um, and we're, we're sort of like of the thing of the uh, mind that we, we don't ever count on government. We never make it part of our business plan, but we, it's nice when it's there and we build, we build projects around it for sure, but we don't ever sort of like rest our laurels on that. And I've seen a lot of young companies actually try that where they actually bank on that being part of it and then it doesn't come and then they have nothing. So it's like we've never made it a big part of it, but we've applied for it. And we have a full-time person that's like, responsible for helping us through the application phase, interviewing us, making sure that we, we were kept up to date on all our milestones. And um, you know that's a huge, huge part of it. And I don't think we'd be here today without it. Um, the biggest take, uh, piece that I'm kind of going to go into is just the balance. And I think this is true like, of anything that you say, you want to balance it with something that is true or something you could prove. Um, so what do you do? So what do you do? I mean, basically, what is your product or service? And so whatever it is you say it is, you will get more points in your investment pitch or your business plan is if you have think, something to back it up that is relevant to it. So if you say, I'm going to create a, you know, um, a fitness band, like Fitbit. Okay, cool. So either, like, what somebody's gonna look at is like, hey, why, why, what do you know about this? Did, you know, did you work for a company that was like Fitbit for many years? Like that would give you top points. Um, are you an engineer that has created devices that are similar like this, but maybe not in the fitness world? You know, get full points. And then if you think about, I've had experience, you know, I have 30 years of experience or 20 years of experience building products of any kind, and then you get a couple more points. Or do you like, I have this great idea for a fitness band, but my co-founder has it. So like you just sort of need to balance whatever it is. And, 
it's okay that if you don't, but you get a little bit less points, um, as, especially when somebody's just hearing you for the first time, than you would as if, you, if those things are true. So, I mean, you could get away with it. Like, like I said, I, I didn't have any 3D experience in, in the first company I pitched, but it was okay because I proved that we had the team to do it. And, and also that we had the research and I proved myself as knowledgeable. So those are all parts. Parts of that are just skills. Either you've acquired the skills, but the more that that balance, the better it is. And otherwise you have to pick up points somewhere else down the line. And that's okay too. And that's like just a runaway idea. The problem too, so you introduce a problem, you have to back that up too. So if you say that, you know, um, millions of people around the world are, you know, their, their tap water isn't suitable for drinking. Okay, cool, now you have to prove that. So now you have to like demonstrate that in your pitch deck or have some stat that you can rhyme off like this or show sort of like that that's a real problem. And you also want to talk about how big that problem is and, and, and with legitimate numbers. You can't just say a lot of people are having this problem. A lot, you know, you have to say like 1.1 million people in every state, you know, whatever that is. You, you need all those parts. And if you can demonstrate the problem, like show the competition not working, like the, the closer you get to something as tangible as that, the better. So like if we're pitching, we're showing our competition. We're running them through exactly what we say we're gonna do. And we do that across multiple competitions and we get more points for that. And if you have something that just doesn't work, like then you could hold it up and show and show the investors and show them like, here, this is, the, this is what's out there in the marketplace today. Um, and that you know, you're intimately aware of all these ones and the problems and specifics, then that's, that's really, really good. And of course, the less you get away from that, the less points you get and you gotta pick them up somewhere else. But if you don't, you can't articulate the problem properly, you basically just put a zero there. Like you just, you didn't get those points at all. How do you solve it better than anyone? So this is like sort of where the innovation part gets into, is like if you have an innovative idea. Um, there's a lot of different ways to be innovative though. Some people think that it's just on like, I have to create something that's like, like this, this super algorithm that nobody has or I have this super chemical formula for a product that nobody has. That's not always true. That's true of the ones that like, that's something that where you can uh, have patent protection really reduces the risk to the investors is that they feel like, okay, this is something that's defendable, nobody else can get it, so that means you're gonna carve off some market position. And if you've done the other two parts, so you, you have a really good problem and you have a really good solution, then, and you guys do it uniquely and it's protectable, like those are checks across all the boxes, it's a slam dunk, there's almost like nothing can go wrong if I, in, in terms of, the, as long as like the next couple slides are true. Um, but you can also innovate on process and you can innovate on um, um, sort of like just how you, how you make things. You just make it better. You, um, you know, the, you can actually have it part of um, something like the manufacturing process. You can have one piece of that that you do better than anyone else. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but like what people look at as innovation is literally that. Is it something that can scale that no, they will, people will take a long time before they could catch up to you. Um, but you do have to demonstrate that as well too. So this is where like, I, t I tell some of the people I'm mentoring, it's like, you need something demonstrable like before you even start taking for money, at least, at least from, from any sort of angel. Um, and, and it could be a very rudimentary way. So like I work with a guy who's uh, working um, on, a, on an artificial intelligence technology and he has big plans of sort of making it uh, this whole software, this beautiful interface. Um, but really what he, all he needed to prove his concept was just what he can do in code. And so we urged him sort of like, just create a prototype where feed some information on and just like one input field and hit enter and then watch what the AI can do and actually in code and you actually see it building and then you see it delivering. And that's actually enough at that point to get investment because it's what you said, why you said is better is true. It doesn't have to be commercially ready because those are actually to your favors that they know that's what you need the money for. So at any stage that you have that's something demonstrable where the, the, the idea could really click, that will go a long way. And telling a story to that part, that, that kind of like brings the last three points uh, uh, together, is that if you can bring it all together and you tell a story about how you encountered the problem, why your solution is better, what, what sort of eureka idea that you had, then it's like, then you almost get a bonus point for those last three because you strung them all together. Do people care? So just sort of having evidence of that, um, this is the hardest part for some people to actually do, especially if, if no one's actually experienced your product. But you can actually do that through, do they experience products like it, is it in a big way? Um, but you can also do things like in advance of getting funding, is like just asking people, video testimonials, anything you can do that says, asking people like, what would have to be true for you to like this? What is your biggest frustrations with company XYZ that you're gonna compete against? 
Um, you know, legitimate surveys, anything where you, you can take something qualitative and turn it quantitative, that really, really helps because it's very real. Sometimes people are trying to raise money like we did on a cocktail napkin, on just an idea, just a, just a PowerPoint. But you can still get these other things. And if you have a little bit further than that, if you actually have some real customers or even in a beta way or a free way, then actually showing those metrics and any sort of traction quickly is, is the biggest thing. Like that, that goes far and above. And all this kind of goes to like, that most investors don't really, unless they're super strategic, they don't really care what you do, like what you say, as long as all these things are true, like, cause it doesn't really matter. It could be something that's really sort of off the wall. But if you have traction and you have domain expertise and you have a problem that's big, like all of those things come together and then they'll, they'll almost invest in anything. That's especially smart investors, sophisticated investors, they'll get it. They'll invest in anything that checks along all those boxes. So you want to sort of like evaluate your businesses and say, do I have something that people care about and can I demonstrate that in the same way? Um, just judging by reactions to people, I said like, let's think about like the best case scenario of, of how you could prove that your product is exciting, even in a prototype way. Like let's say you had something that was like, um, some, you built this new type of earphones and then you went to an earphone expert at a trade show and you put the earphones on them and then you took a, a, a video from your phone of him freaking out and saying, oh my God, this is the best I've ever heard. Like that would almost be like full points right there. So it's like, you try and achieve something like that and maybe uh, that's not always possible, but you want to get close to that and then every time you get away from that, then you start to lose points and again, you better pick points up somewhere else. Can you make money? So this comes down to, to business model. Um, a lot of people get this part wrong and this also gives a determination of sort of like, um, just that you can scale it all. Is this a big enough problem where you can make enough money that you can get the investor's return? You know, this sort of determines like, is your problem big enough? Is your idea big enough? And it doesn't have to be now. And people kind of get that you're like, well, we're gonna start small, but the, the vision has to be there that, you know, we can actually take this global, we can take this to Europe, we can do all these different things and that we can demonstrate that as a problem. But this, this is sort of the easier thing to prove because you can kind of prove business models a little bit in just like with Excel, just that you sort of thought about it. Um, some of it will come into point is like, what is the market bearing in terms of price? Uh, what is the competition charging? How, many co how much competition is there? Is there even a point for you to actually enter the market? How much would it cost to get there? Um, and, and so when we talk about business model, we also talk about like, how much would it cost to get to, if you, cause if you just say something like global, like, hey, we want to be global, that gets really expensive. And then you're like, okay, well, when do you want to do that? And then they start to check your other thing, which is like, let's check your timeline, your milestones. When are you going to do all this stuff? It's okay not to do it right away, but at least you have to have a plan and that you don't think that you're going to do that in the first six months. They don't, you know, they, they just, they can figure out those parts. Um, the business model is also like, how is, this, how is the business model scalable? So is this something where people have to come into your store locally and purchase? That's not as scalable, unless your idea is to do a bunch of franchises, but then that's like, that's scalable. It also changes your demands for money. But if you have something that can be distributed, that's why some, a lot of these internet startups get so valued so much, because they're, they're really scalable. If you have an idea and it, it can self-serving, all you do is pay for server costs, that's it. That's your only sort of thing, and maybe, maybe if it's something they order, but if it's not, and it's just like, like content or video that people are paying for, that's the ultimate most scalable. And like I said, like I like that model the most, because I like software. Why? Because we put it on a server, we charge money for people to access it, we have no cost. Like our costs are only our labor. Um, but to me, that's like the best model, because, and we like subscription. Subscription is people really get. Anything where people are paying on, their, on an ongoing basis, because it makes your business really simple to sort of operate. All you have to do is really keep getting more subscribers and making sure they don't cancel. I mean, that, that's oversimplifying it, and there's many different tools we use to sort of like dive into that. Like we, we focus a lot on retention. Retention, just making sure that they're, um, the people that are even trying it are, are sticking around and that they're consuming it more. Like we want to make sure that they're consuming it every day. You know, something like Instagram has probably one of the highest con consumption rates of any sort of software out there because people use it every day and multiple times a day. Everything else is probably slightly stepped down from that. I don't know how many tools anybody else uses like that in that way. So those types of businesses go really well because it's very easy to communicate scale. Once you get into product or anything you have to hold in your hand or manufacturing, again, scale becomes a little bit difficult to prove because it's like you really have to focus a lot on how many of these can you sell, how many of those things, because nobody wants to hold inventory. That's sort of like a bit old school business unless that's your thing is you don't want to hold inventory. So you have to think about um, what, what is the cost of manufacturing that at low rates, at high rates, whatever, because you don't want to just, just for the cost. Um, and some people forget about distrib uh, distributing that. So if you have a product that somebody can hold, how are you going to get it out to all these people? 
some people forget that sometimes that's done else. Things you buy at Best Buy or whatnot, because I've talked to a lot of young people as well. When they build their costs, their manufacturing costs, they're looking at it as like, I can beat the competition. The competition is $100. I've done the, I've done the research. I can manufacture this for $50. I can kill them on price. You're like, yeah, except that they have to give 25 points, 25% uh, to the person that's gonna put it in all the stores, and then the store's gonna take 25%. So that's 50% right off the top. So yeah, they can too, but they have to charge it in order sort of to make a profit and make it back. And people forget about that all the time. And that's just sort of understanding the distribution part of it. And the internet's not much different. It's just that you don't have to deal with that as much. But sometimes you have channels. There's a lot of affiliate programs that you have when you're trying to sell uh, online that when you take 30%, you give 30% to the affiliate. That's a big chunk, right? So that does affect your price. If you, you know, if you go in thinking like, well, we can sell this for $10, and now you're only making $7, but your costs were based on seven, like, Especially when they tell you using business school, they're like, you should have a 30% markup, but then you're giving 30% away right to the first affiliate. It's good because they'll do it for you, and that's probably the most um, common rate is 20 to 30% that you give to an affiliate just to click on your link and then that they get it out of the subscription. You know, it's, it's part of that. But you have to know all these parts of how you're gonna make money, how you make money in the future. A big part too, this is sort of like this test where they, the, you know, when we raise capital right on the show floor almost is, getting really good at sort of like, can we do it? Because like, all of those things could be true. Every other slide I've said to that point, it's the right problem, right market, right everything. But then it comes down to like, can, can you actually do it yourself? Like, you know, I'm not an engineer. Well, okay, well then you need an engineer. That's gotta be part of your plan or part of your pitch. Um, and if you can fill that out early, and especially as you're sort of planning your businesses and you're thinking about who, who's gonna be my co-founders, you wanna fill in those other gaps. And you can say, okay, this person is the business person, I'm sort of like the seller who's gonna be doing the marketing and the content, and this other person has a manufacturing experience. You can, with three people, you can actually connect all the dots there, and you can actually answer all these questions, especially if like, you get more points for the more evidence that they're the right person. This person's a PhD in engineering. This person used to work for GE. You know, as far as this business person, this business person has their MBA, this business person went to Stanford. All, like, you start ramping up, and then sometimes you can, pick up a lot of points here that if your points are weak on the other one, then this, this sort of still works. Um, and that kind of goes to with experience as well. The, the number two point is probably the biggest one is, can you communicate with energy and passion? Do you have the skills to do that? If you don't, um, they'll see that right away. Like if you're like, yeah, we're, we're, we're the world's best, uh, whatever. Like they'll sniff that right away. They're like, you're not gonna be able to raise any more capital. You're not gonna be able to convince employees to join your company. And you're not gonna be able to convince people to part with their credit card. Especially, you know, you see all these, these founders that you know of successful companies and they're so good at sort of pitching their own product and delivering it that those were easy ones. You just know that they were easy to raise money all the time and to, to get people to, they know you'll be successful. Story and vision, I think story, I've said it a few times on the different slides because I think those connect it all together. If you can take all these points and have a, a sort of like an answer for each one of those or at least sort of like a strategy, you can connect those all with the story. And, and, and you hear those stories all the time. Those are the most successfully funded companies. Are like, I started one day where you know, me and my roommate were in our dorm at Stanford. And so there's your, your sort of your domain expertise. We're, we're in the business program and we were just talking one day. We're looking at, you know, there's, there's you know, it's very difficult to do this. Um, we asked a lot of people on the floor. Um, they all sort of said this thing. We started checking it out and then we found out that we could do this. And then you could just see all that story and then you tie it all the way down to like, what it is, and you tell it in a very sort of energetic and passionate way, and then you just connected all those other slides together. Um, rapport is, is probably big, that's just sort of being like, being a nice person, or sort of picking that person in your, um, in your company that is, that is the person that you want, when you meet with them, you want to go for a beer with. Uh, investors sort of get that right away too, is that they just sort of like, they want to like you, they want to work with you for a long time, especially at the angel route, because they're in for a long time. When they're in the, 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 that early, they're in for like three, four years. They know that automatically. So they, they gotta like you. And if you're not that likable, maybe leave the pitching to somebody that's like, and that's fine. Like you can be this sort of introverted engineer, that's fine. But then that's sort of where we talk about the hustler, hustler hacker designer. This, this is sort of like a concept in Silicon Valley, but it's so true and it's exactly the model that we followed. Our hustler, um, Scott, who's not here, but he's, he's a hustler. He's the guy that you wanna go for a beer with. He's the guy that you wanna know, do you wanna just, be his friend, you just hope that he texts you. Like th those are sort of the things that you want and, th and th that's sort of like, the investors want that too. Um, and, and so do your customers at the end of the day. Um, and, and improve it is sort of like kind of what I've been saying all along there is how to get that. 
Um, key milestones, this is sort of a thing that we can answer if you're weak in a lot of areas. It's just knowing how you will measure success and but that you have a realistic plan to sort of continue. And, and at what sort of gate um, that is, if, if everything you say is true, that you get through that, that they can measure you and say that you're on track, you're killing it, or you're not doing well. If you don't have that, then it's really difficult and people are gonna lose a lot of faith in you. I think your, your employees, your co-founders, your, your family, your investors, they're all gonna sort of lose faith in you. Um, and you probably lose faith in yourself. So I think it's, it's really early to set those milestones up really early on anything. So even if you don't, you're not doing investment right now, set some things. What's it gonna be successful? Even to get to the next milestone, you have to know it's ultimately successful, but if you, you think it's like, oh, I wish, uh, 100 people would follow me on Facebook. Okay, well, say, that's, that's okay. Say 100 people, if that's important to your thing or your next milestone, but you're like, um, say, okay, I want 100 people to follow me by February 14th. That's my goal. And then, then, then just get into this culture of hitting that. And, and, but you actually need realistic milestones that are, are, are normal for your industry and also normal for what would it take to get, to show that you, you have a demonstrable path to an exit for every investor. Um, but getting that early, and, and what I tell young people as well is like, know what success means to you as an individual. So what would have to happen if you take this investment for you to consider your success in 10 years from now, or, or five years from now? Do you, do you want millions of dollars? Do you want a really good job? Do you want to grow a company? You just like growing a company. You want to pr is it very holistic? You want to just provide clean water to the entire world and want to make sure that you keep doing that. Those are all things that you want to know really, really early because it's gonna sort of impact how you, treat these milestones and also it's gonna come across to all those other slides that I just said. Um, sort of where are you now? This is sort of like just depending on your stage of your business. I've, you know, you've already sold a bunch of stuff and all you wanna do is sell it to the world. You've sold it locally, you've sold millions of them, now you wanna sell it world. So that's sort of like knowing, okay, well what's the next measure of success for you now? Is it is like, okay, we wanna conquer Canada. And what does conquering Canada mean? What does conquering mean? Oh, if we sell a million units. A million units by when? If we sell a million units by June 1st across Canada, we'll be successful. Okay, I can buy into that. And, what is, and then it's like, you, that's your next milestone, but your, your milestone after that, what's that? Well, we wanna go worldwide, and we wanna send 10 million, 10 million units. And we don't have to worry about that now, we just have to know that you know that that is, and that that will require another either capital injection or the first thing to do really well. And as long as you thought of all those things, the investors kind of get it, and they, they, then they'll bring it back and be like, okay, let's just focus on you getting your first 100 right now. Um, and that's sort of like any gaps you have. So if, like we talked about like early on, if you're missing an expertise, so you're like, okay, me and my co-founder, again, we're, we're, we're uh, you know, just students. Um, we're, we're both, we're not developers, we're not engineers, but we have this really good idea, and we need your money to help prototype it and work with an engineering firm. Okay, cool, then you didn't need the engineer as a co-finder. You don't have to be engineers, but you have a plan. You're gonna work with that engineer firm. Bonus points is if you've already found that firm and you've already got a quote back. Um, or you know that, okay, once we get to this milestone of a thousand, then we're gonna hire an engineer. And we need your money to, to make sure that we can hire them. Okay, cool, now you've just connected the parts, you got back to the thing. Okay, now you've answered one of those questions. Okay, you got a little bit more points back. If you were weak back there, then you can bring it together. This is probably like sort of near the end, but it's like, this is usually at the end of what we, when we talk about it, because you've had, you would have had to prove all of the other those things and get a reasonable score in order to get somebody to ask you how much you need and when does it, what does it get me? Um, and this, this is sort of what something you want to relate back to milestones because this shows that the, the journey and how big it can be. And that's sort of get an evaluation. And there's, it's, it's probably its own topic on its own. It's just like how do you determine valuation? But early on, it's like you have to prove something that's valuable. And, and some of it is like without, um, if, if you're sort of in like a retail business or something like that, it's usually like a multiple of sales. But when you're in innovation, you can't really do that because you don't have anything, you have no uh, history. So your evaluation is really at the beginning is how much do you need and how much of the company you're willing to get out. It's, it's that simple. There's sort of like averages in that and usually it's like somewhere between 20% on any given round. And that's sort of what we talked about earlier was you don't want to take too much too early because if you think you can grow value, if you say you're worth $2 million and you wanna take $500,000, um, know, it's a pretty big share, but you, you actually want, you think you, with that $500,000 that you can turn that into $10 million by hitting your milestones, then you, you wanna do that. Like you don't wanna take the 10 million now even if you can get it, even if somebody offers it to you because they're not gonna give you a good valuation. If you're, you know what I mean, like it just, it just can't happen, you can't defend that. So I think it's like, you take a, just enough that you need, but I always tell people too, like, think about what you need 
and how long you need it. And, and what's common in the tech world is you're always thinking 12 to 18 month cycles. So what do you need for 12 to 18 months in order to sort of prove your idea? Um, and what does that cost mean to you? Is it two, two co-founders? Um, you know, salaries usually at that stage is usually try and eat that part of on your own. But if you do something you want to sort of like leave your job or something like that, then you take the absolute minimum that you need to survive. But then your costs are what? Then they're manufacturing. Again, we have to hire an engineering firm. We have to get this thing coded. We have to build a prototype. We have to work with a, a 3D manufacturer, whatever it is. Um, then those go in your costs. But I would even double it again. I don't think anyone's sort of hit their um, costing appropriately. And you want to give yourself uh, a little bit of breathing room. Um, also choose like, this is all this time when you want to start applying for the government stuff as well. And if all those things are well, then they usually follow that the same way. But then that sort of gives you another sort of like a uh, little bit of breathing room as well to A, hire more people in a very efficient way. Um, and then you get into sort of terms and uh, this, this changes again depending on the stage. When you're working with angel investors, they, they're usually driving a lot of the terms unless you're sophisticated enough business way. But you basically, it's pretty simple at the beginning. It's like they're giving you money for a piece of your company. Um, the riskier it is, the more they can really, really drive the term sheet. Um, they can do things like, because they, if they really kind of like don't really believe you, but they still think it's interesting, they're willing to take the chance, they want a little bit more control. So some angels will trounce it out. They'll say, okay, I'll give you $100,000, but $25,000 a quarter, or $25,000 a year, or, or um, and I get to claw it back if you don't hit your milestones. Now, or if you do hit your milestones, I'll give you a little bit more. So they'll do things to mitigate the risk. Um, and it's still better than banks, because banks, you sort of need, you actually need the revenue. Like you actually need to know that you're, they're actually gonna get paid back. They're, they're like the lowest risk where angel investors take high risk, but they want high rewards. So again, something you have to be ready for that if you think you can get them their money back eight times, then it, it's a good path for you. And then, or they just sort of wanna be business. Like that's the other thing. Um, and then they're, they're always gonna think in the back of the mind, even though they don't want you to think about that right now. It's just how are you gonna exit? Um, sometimes they frame that to us as like, okay, who would buy you? And they're telling us when we have a piece of, a napkin with a little piece of blue pen on it. And they're like, who would buy you? And we have to be like, uh, well, Google or, like we have to have be prepared for those answers and say why. And say like, okay, well, we think Google might buy us because they're sort of, you know, um, entering the enterprise space and there's a lot of competition, they need innovation solutions. We have to have that sort of answer. So anybody from the angel investment community is gonna sort of think about that and you kind of want an answer there. So. You know, who's gonna buy you or how am I gonna get my money back? And for some businesses, it's not sort of like a, something where somebody would acquire you, it's more of like, we'll start giving a dividend once we reach this milestone. Once we reach 12 million in sales, uh, all of our franchise stores have all been deployed across our first sort of wave, um, then we'll cut you back a dividend. Like that's sort of how we're gonna get your money back in, until you sort of do. So that's sort of like something they think about in the back of your mind, otherwise they wouldn't do it. And something you have to be just conscious of. People aren't just gonna give you money for no reason. This is just sort of an example of like, milestones is from uh, somebody else's deck, but like just how they think about it and sort of where they are today. So 49 units, partially automated. By January, we want to hit 300 units. This is what we're going to do. And this is what they'll be used to measure you with some forgiveness, but um, that's why they're, they're sort of talking in quarters and that's, that's probably the, as accurate as you can, but it, it does keep you sort of like running in the right way, sort of like knowing how to ratchet your efforts. If you're starting to fall behind, then it's a lot more nights and weekends. It's a lot of that type of stuff. But this is sort of how you think about your business, sort of like strings together all those other things. Like I said, if you have a hole there, if it's a hire or if it's an expertise, then you fill it in here. And, and then it all, as long as it all makes sense and you can sort of draw the whole circle back together, it's gonna be sort of really easy to get some, convince somebody to give you money.